This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. It's both kind and rational To like knowing animals I can't deny it's fashionable To like knowing animals Hello everyone and welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast in which we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Josh Milburn and I do like knowing animals. This episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. I'm a member and you can become one too. Membership is very reasonably priced and comes with a range of benefits. The episode is also brought to you by the Animal Public's book series from Sydney University Press. This is a great collection of books about animal studies. Today we're talking about frogs, and the very first book in the Animal Public series was all about frogs. Well, almost anyway. Cane Toads, A Tale of Sugar, Politics and Flawed Science by Nigel Turvey was released in 2013. And also a quick shout out to Elizabeth Usher, who provided the updated theme tune for Knowing Animals. To learn more about Elizabeth, visit veganthused.com. Today I'm very pleased to introduce you to Dr Hannah Borst. Hannah is a lecturer slash assistant professor and Ad Astra Fellow in the School of English, Drama and Film at University College Dublin in Ireland. She's probably best known for her work on literature and water. Her first book was called Hydrofictions, Water, Power and Politics in Israeli and Palestinian Literature and was released in 2020 by Edinburgh University Press. But she works more broadly in resource politics, political ecology, food studies, queer ecology and critical animal studies. Today we're going to talk about a paper that touches on several of these themes. Theorising the gay frog is, at time of recording, imminently forthcoming in the journal Environmental Humanities. Welcome to the podcast, Hannah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So what led you to working on gay frogs? So I spend a lot of time on the internet. Um, and talk to my friends about the things that I see. And a few years ago, a lot of the things that we were seeing were frog memes. So these were inspired by the far-right broadcaster Alex Jones's um, a clip from his show Infowars, where he panics about chemicals in the water turning the frogs gay. And when a friend showed me that clip, I was kind of entranced by it, because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was so bizarre, it was, it was so exaggerated... And it was kind of frightening as well, because he's a sort of paranoid conspiracy theorist. But there was also a, a particular, it was a kind of genre of camp that I was also <laughs> kind of intrigued by, drawn to. And I, I wanted to think more about what on earth is going on in that clip, which everybody seemed to be talking about a few years ago. Let's get the obvious out of the way. There's something quite funny about a full-grown man spitting with rage, shouting that the powers that be are, quote, putting chemicals in the water that turn the fricking frogs gay, right? Well, yeah, it is very funny. Um, and that, that's, why, that's why I was amused. That's why, that's why it had so many views. But, of course, there is something risky about the humour here as well, which is that we're all laughing at Alex Jones, but that inadvertently can end up spreading these far-right messages. As I talk about in the article, the use of humour is used by the alt-right, or it was used by them, they're they're kind of on the decline now, but it was used by them for for spreading far-right messages. So there's a kind of politics of humour going on that is easy to miss. So it's often easy to to miss the the meanings of of humour, because we kind of see it as something trivial, something silly. But in the article, I was trying to think seriously about humour and what it does politically. Um, why we should take Alex Jones seriously rather than just laughing at him for being gullible. Yeah, I mean, I first came across this gay frogs idea in exactly that context. It was people unsympathetic to Jones's politics, laughing at these rants that he puts out. But I understand there's actually a sense in which Jones was right and that pollutants in water are or were actually disrupting frogs and their sexuality. Yeah, so Jones isn't completely wrong, and I suppose that's some of what he does. He takes ideas that have some level of plausibility and some level of truth, but but turns them into a paranoid conspiracy theory that that fuels far-right ideologies. The idea of frogs becoming gay, and I'm kind of doing (laughs) 
hand-waving quote marks, air quotes, around the idea of gay frogs. That idea came to mainstream prominence in the 1990s through the work of the University of California biologist Tyrone Hayes. He, he was increasingly finding frogs that had different sexual morphologies. So he would find frogs with testes and ovaries, or he would find frogs with multiple sets of testes or ovaries. And some of these frogs could reproduce, even though they were ostensibly male frogs. So we kind of have a complication here around the idea of what it means to talk about a gay frog, because this, this is, I suppose this in some ways connects back to like 19th century, early 20th century ideas of, of, of gay people as somehow biologically different, but of course that's not how we talk about homosexuality today. So the frogs that Tyrone Hayes was finding might be more accurately talked about as intersex frogs rather than gay frogs. But of course, that is not as easy to make a meme about or to joke about on the internet. So it sort of becomes taken up in the, the media representation as um, gay frogs and other gay animals. So I suppose it's probably worth, worth talking about why the frogs were being turned gay and why people think animals get turned gay by chemicals in the water. So the chemicals in the water that Jones is referring to are what's called endocrine disrupting chemicals, so EDCs. And these are chemicals that are used in a lot of products. They're used in fertilisers, they're used in plastics. So one that got, gets a lot of attention is bisphenol A, or um, BPAs. The type of endocrine disrupting chemicals that Alex Jones is concerned about is xenoestrogens. So xenoestrogens are a type of endocrine disrupting chemical that mimics the function of estrogen in the body. So there's a kind of concern that Jones plays on. Um, to appeal to alt-right sensibilities, that these endocrine disrupting chemicals will have a feminising effect on bodies that were born male. I mean, we saw this in a UK context a few years ago with the former Lib Dem leader Tim Farron, who um, tweeted that chemicals in the water were causing rising numbers of gay people, and gay people were like the fish and the frogs, although he later said that he had been hacked and denied responsibility for that tweet. So you see this idea popping up in a lot of different places. You also see it in concern about the impacts of the contraceptive pill and HRT in the water supply, which kind of turns into a familiar form of victim blaming of women for taking control over their bodies and sexuality. There is some level of truth in what Jones is saying. Part of what I was trying to talk about in the article is that we need to be really careful with how we talk about environmental pollution and contamination because this can play into the hands of the far right. I do want to ask a bit about right-wing politics and particularly the alt-right, because as you say, this is an idea that we associate very strongly with the alt-right. But what I was really interested in the article and what was brand new to me was the way that you linked gay frogs to a kind of alt-right environmentalism. So a three-part question. Who are the alt-right? What's their connection with environmental movements, if any? And how do gay frogs fit in all of that? Okay, so who are the alt-right? I mean, in some ways, it might be more appropriate to say who were the, or who, who was the alt-right, because, you know, this isn't a term that we use so much anymore. This is a term that we were using a couple of years ago, five years ago, to talk about a kind of predominantly white, young-ish group of men, um, a movement from a, predominantly found online, who were disillusioned with mainstream conservatism and alienated by mainstream politics, particularly what they saw as you know, li liberal movements of f feminism, multiculturalism and everything else. But they sort of fractured. Um, people tend to say that that happened after the 2017 Unite the Right rally at Charlottesville in Virginia, which became really violent and led to the death of one of the anti-fascist activists. So in some ways, it, this might not. It, we might think, why do we even need to talk about this anymore? Because the alt right might be something in the past. But I think that a lot of the the motivations that were encouraging members of the alt right, these kind of currents still persist in American culture and around the world. You know, there are still men who are ah! off at feminism and <laughs> gay people, at trans people, people of color, and don't know what to do with those energies. And there are people keen to take advantage of that. Um, and there are these kind of new movements that came out of the alt-right, so we might think about the QAnon conspiracy theories, um, and also the Proud Boys, who are more kind of more like a street movement who've been getting more attention in, in the past year. So who are the alt-right, or who were the alt-right? 
I think that's the first part of your question. And you also asked about the environmental politics of the alt-right. I said that the alt-right are a movement that were disillusioned with mainstream conservatism. But of course, they share, they share many other characteristics with mainstream conservatism, such as a disdain for feminism and a kind of sense that they've been cheated out of something that, that was their right, that they deserved. But one of the ways that they are different from mainstream conservatism is that traditional conservatism we might see as more associated with climate denial. And there's a kind of saying, none of this stuff is happening, it doesn't matter if we carry on using really polluting SUVs. And, and this is the politics of you know, the Bush administration and, yeah, more recent traditional conservatism. But the alt-right has generally been more receptive to climate and environmental politics. And and this is kind of because of their borrowings from eco-fascism and their investment in natural order, natural hierarchies, their sort of right to rule as, as white men. So it's a movement that's associated with eco-fascism and this allow this kind of becomes a vehicle for them to talk about to kind of fuel racist panics over immigration, over population, and white habitat loss to immigrants configured as a kind of invasive species that is endangering the native white population. So I mean, we see a few things going on here. One of them is a an ironic borrowing of the vocabulary of the left, which is a kind of constant feature of of alt-right politics. We also see, I guess, a reflection of ourselves in the mirror that we don't want to think about. So the the right wing and reactionary history of environmentalism, because environmentalists haven't been immune from endorsing really nasty ideas about immigration and overpopulation. So we see that in people like Dave Foreman, in Earth First, Edward Abbey, many of the major figures of 20th and 21st century environmentalism. I mean, even David Attenborough is not immune to making some of these points, right? So this is a far-right movement, but it's a far-right movement that ta- that tells us things about mainstream environmentalism as well. Now, the gay frogs aren't the only frogs that are featuring in this strange soup of <laughs> alt-right views and environmentalism and conservatism and libertarianism and all the other influences that are going on there. You mentioned that there's a broader frog iconography, which is a phrase I really liked. So along with the gay frogs, there's Pepe, there's Keck, and there's a variety of others. So could you introduce us to this frog iconography? <laughs> I mean, it, it's... It's a tricky thing to talk about because, you you know, it's clear that we both find this quite funny and there is a sort of emanation of creativity and playfulness in this creation of this whole universe. But of course, it is it's it's a problem as well, because it's it is ultimately in the service of a far right politics. But that said, (laughs) I'll tell you about the frogs. So Pepe, of course, is probably the best known alt right frog. So he came from a comic strip by the American comic artist Matt Fury called, I think it's called Boys Club. And he first appeared in a strip where he's observed pulling his trousers all the way down to piss. And then he's kind of seen by somebody else walking in through the door. And people are, that person, you know, is sort of shocked (laughs) at what Pepe is doing, but Pepe doesn't care. And he says, you know, feels good, man. And that's his catchphrase. I think it's Cynthia Miller Idris who says that th- this is how Pepe comes to stand in for a kind of superior nonchalance that en- enables his sort of alt-right appropriation. He's a figure that pursues his own desires without being compromised what, by what society thinks that he should be doing. But then, of course, Pepe is also... He's also... The sad Pepe, right? Like, feel, feels bad man. <laughs> so so he gets appropriated in that way as well. Uh, and he's kind of used to, as an ironic way of thinking about a sense of vic- victimhood and being persecuted, but where the, these kind of alt-right posters are talking about, they're, they're setting themselves up, but while also making a claim to loss and victimhood. And then Kek in Kekistan. I mean, that really is a, a rabbit hole. <laughs> So I suppose th- this again is is a, is a parody of left wing vocabularies. Kekistan is a parody of left wing vocabularies of identity politics. So it, it's used to talk about people can claim their identity as a Kekistani if they're on the alt right, and this I this kind of claim 
first rose to prominence with YouTuber Sargon of Akkad, who's Carl Benjamin, who later ran as a, I think, a UKIP candidate in the 2019 European elections. And he said that people on the alt-right should list their ethnicity in um, a British census as Kekistani. So Kekistan is an imaginary nation whose inhabitants are said to worship um, the Egyptian frog-headed god Kek, and his prophet is Pepe. But there's a whole load of these strange coincidences that circle around the idea of Kekistan that would be seen by the alt-right as, as examples of meme magic. So these allow them to build, to build up this idea of Kekistan as having all of these features of a nation. So, for instance, it has a national anthem, which is the song Chardelle by the Italo, Italo disco band P.E.P.E., and on the single artwork, they, they have a, a frog. <laughs> so there's this kind of strange coincidence that they, they, they sort of draw on to create this strange national culture. And, and they use that to make claims for their national culture as allowing them to be racist, which is kind of, you know, we're, we're not racist, we're not misogynists, it's our religion. Yeah, th- th- this is a way that they're trying to be Islamophobic and, and to kind of spread harmful ideas about other races and religions. Well, you weren't joking about a rabbit hole. There's obviously so much going on here. So let me ask the obvious question. Why frogs? Or is it just a coincidence that we're seeing these frog characters emerging repeatedly in the alt-right imaginary? Well, there clearly are some coincidences here. I mean, the Italian band P.E.P. were not thinking of alt-right iconography when they put a frog on their single artwork in the 1980s. But but that said, I don't think this would work in quite the same way with any other animal. There is something about the frog that explains why the frog has been taken up in all of these contexts. So in the article, I draw quite a lot on Charlotte Slay's book for the Reaction Animals series, Frog. And she talks about frogs as liminal creatures, frogs that are kind of creatures of the in-between. They're creatures of the in-between in quite a few different ways. They're, of course, amphibians. They're born in water, and then they they move between land and water as adults. They go through a really quite extreme metamorphosis from eggs to tadpoles to to frogs. They're kind of weird little creatures. They're they're human-like, but they're also very much not like humans. They've got eyes on the front of their head like, like we have. They've almost got little hands, but they hop about in a way that means that they're often in haunted houses and, and kind, kind of horror stories. You know, a witch might put a frog in her cauldron because they're seen as kind of disgusting and, and bad and contaminating. But in terms of the alt-right use, I think a relevant feature of the frog is that they're also known for being sexually quite weird. You know, they lay a lot of eggs. They're not like, they're, they're very different from humans in that sense. They have some really quite odd mating practices. So they kind of have mass mating rituals. The Suriname toad is not a toad you want to look up online if you have trypophobia, so a a fear of holes, because it incubates its eggs in holes in its back, which I find quite viscerally revolting. So there are sort of, there are ways that the frog itself kind of brings together a few different ideas about about sex, about strangeness and liminality. And the other one that I've not mentioned, but which is, of course, really important, is frogs and nationality and difference. So you mentioned a book about cane toads. Cane toads are an invasive species. So we often hear about, we also hear about the American bullfrog spreading into different environments where where it shouldn't be. So fro- frogs are creatures that are useful for thinking about, about borders, which, which allows them to become this vehicle for thinking about all sorts of different borders, from nation to, to species to, to the borders of the body. So it seems like there's a bit of an ambiguity here between the gay frogs initially as victims of pollution. They've been turned gay against their consent, against their will. But then also the gay frogs as a kind of threat when you're talking about this border crossing, these ambiguities, as a threat to a certain kind of masculine identity. So are they playing both roles simultaneously? Well, I mean, this is a part of the article that was a little bit more speculative and theoretical, where I'm trying to hold a few ideas in my head at once. But I think, you know, right, right-wing ideology is a space of contradictions, and it's, it's not, it wouldn't be a surprise 
if the alt right were to be holding multiple ideas in in their heads at once. I think the frog is playing multiple roles because it's a sort of small innocent creature that you can that you almost you might feel a, a kind of sense of protectiveness towards because it's, it's very easily trodden on and, and squished. So it's something that that might seem like it can embody a sense of vulnerability and and, and risk, but it's also something frogs move, move as a mass. They're, they're in these kind of mass mating rituals or in um in all of the eggs that you might see in a pond in the spring. And that allows them to become a vehicle for anxieties about mass movement of people as well. So I think there, there's a kind of dual role that they're playing. Let me ask a question that I could imagine my students asking if I'd set your paper for them. <laughs> and bearing in mind, I teach in a politics department or I teach philosophers rather than in English. But something that I think arises quite naturally in this kind of research is you put a great deal of time and thought into the meanings, the connotations, the history, the implications and more of making a joke about a gay frog. But surely the people who are making these memes, the people who upload that dance remix of Alex Jones saying they're turning the freaking frogs gay, surely these people aren't putting that much thought into it. They're just trying to produce something funny or something to convey a crude political message. Well, I mean, I guess in some ways this is what I do as a literature scholar. I like, overread things. <laughs> but I think I think it, it's wrong to think that these ideas and, and that, that jokes aren't worth serious exploration because jokes convey a lot of, of meaning. They're, they're complex things in some ways. So it's something like irony is one of the most, the most complex genres that, that we have. I think it's really important to take this stuff seriously, partly because we have this impulse to to see it as as trivial. And I mean, the idea of a meme it it kind of is throwaway. It's something that you might see for on a on a tweet, and you might like it, and then you forget about it. But the accumulation of these things is important, and it tells us about underlying beliefs and ideologies in our culture. So I think. I would push back against <laughs> against that and say we, we need to take this stuff seriously. Now, Hannah, we ask every guest on Knowing Animals five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I am, yes. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? So I did an English and philosophy degree, so I think I must have read Peter Singer on that. And But I think that the first piece that really made an impression on, on me was probably reading Carol J. Adams' The Sexual Politics of Meat, which I came across in the library, just wandering around. Um, and I thought, well, I've got to read that. <laughs> and it was the first thing I read that made me think that my connection, my, my interest in feminist and environmental politics might be connected, even if ultimately I have different views on how those are connected to Carol Adams. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? So the first piece of pro-animal scholarship that I, that I wrote is actually this, the um, Frogs article. But the first piece of pro-animal scholarship that I had published is another article about Tiger King, which I wrote with the queer ecologist Nicole Seymour. We kind of, we read Tiger King through the cultural history of zoos and the cultural history of tigers and tiger skins. And as a queer ecological text, so it, it's a kind of companion piece to the, the Frogs article. If you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? It would be Sonora Taylor. So her critique of the ableist rhetoric that's often used in animal advocacy really revolutionised the way that I thought about these things. I'd, ne- I'd, I'd, I'd never thought about that connection before, which just seems absurd now. So the way that we talk about animals that have been bred to have disabilities or have, that have become disabled through being farmed intensively obviously has implications for how we think about which lives and bodies are valued and it has implications for humans with disabilities and I think Taylor's work is probably underlying the way that I think about gender and sexuality in the article so the way that we talk about frogs gender and sexuality has implications for how we talk about these things for humans. What do you think is the most important thing that academics can do for animals? Well this is probably an obvious one to say I think academics should go vegan (laughs) This is partly coming out of my work on water. We probably all know about the impacts of beef farming on the environment. So the amount of water that's taken to produce a kilogram of beef is is enormous. But the dairy and egg industries also have huge impacts on the water supply. So dairy farming is very water intensive. But, you know, recent stories about pollution and 
rivers in the UK have this has all been caused by things by the egg industry and by dairy farming. So the destruction of the River Wye is attributed to intensive egg farming. If you had the power to change one thing about the human non human animal relationship, what would it be? I think we need to rethink the categories that we use to understand animals. So uh, rather than just valuing animals for being beautiful or special or noble or distinctive, we, we need to we need to look at animals that are kind of disgusting or, or repulsive uh, and weird, but also even boring. So I think we need to rethink these aesthetic categories that, that we use to think about animals. What are you working on next? So I've got a few projects in the works. The The main one is my big book project, Water Crisis in World Literature. But I've got a few other animal projects on my sleeve. One is an article about animals on Palestinian film, which is drawing on some of Iris Braverman's work, who's another big influence on me. I'm also exploring the possibility for some collaborations with a colleague in biology who works on human wildlife conflicts. He's called Adam Kane, and he works on seagulls. So we've kind of found this point of connection in thinking about (laughs) weird animals, disliked animals, trashy animals. Um, And we're going to try and hopefully think about how we might look at policy, science and pop culture together to talk about seagulls. How can people find out more about your work? They can follow me on Twitter <laughs> on at Hannah Kate Boast, or they can find my university profile page on the University College Dublin website. Well, thanks so much, Hannah, for joining us for this podcast. And thank you, listeners, for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh L. Milburn or on Instagram at a vegan philosopher. Please do tell others about the podcast. Spread the word. I'm Josh Milburn and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D dot com. Ow!